Good morning, everybody. It is Friday, April 16th, the day after what is normally tax day. In any case, today's topic isn't taxes, but it is alternative energy, in particular solar, uh, but really even broader than that. There's been some news of a short attack on one of the battery stocks, uh, which seems to just be a rehash of everything that we knew was a risk with that particular company. But what I want to show you is just how huge the opportunity is in alternative energy and that the current pullback in alternative energy stocks is probably an awfully good opportunity to start sniffing around. So this is the slideshow from the EIA, primarily put together under the Trump administration. So I would expect some changes here in the next couple of quarters, but as you can see, the fastest growing source of energy is solar, followed by wind, geothermal, hydroelectric. Notice there's no growth in fossil fuels. And I think that that is something that people really have to wrap their heads around is that coal is continuing to fall back to nothing, uh, being buried again, so to speak and nuclear isn't getting built anymore. Oil is being disrupted by EVs and natural gas is basically just holding steady at the moment. Could natural gas go higher yet? Maybe, but I think that this projection is probably wrong. I think natural gas is probably choppy and sideways uh, for a long time and probably falls off in the 2030s. And that's one of the things I wanna talk to you about is the Projections that are out there are notoriously bad projections, especially from the government and the international agencies. What tends to be better are the private analysis, the corporate analysis, because they're the ones that are allocating capital. And what I find over and over and over again is when I go through Centio and I look for ideas like solar power projects, I get so many hits that it's off the chart. 17,000 hits, this is just the last two years. 17,000 mentions of solar power projects from utilities. Now think about that. The utilities are telling you that's the direction that they're going. I'm not really sure how much more in your face it can be than the utilities telling you the power is going to come from solar. It's similar to the car companies telling you by 2026, we're going to mostly be hybrids and EVs. And by 2030, we'll be pretty much all the way there. And by sometime in the 2030s, we're not going to be making gasoline powered cars. When the capital allocators tell you this is where they're spending their money, it does not pay to fight them. Similar to don't fight the Fed. So when you take a look at what is really going on around the world, I'm going to show you some of these charts now. What you realize is that there's going to be less coal being used in 10 years, just like there was less coal being used this year from last year. And while, yes, there are a handful of coal power plants being built and a handful of nuclear power plants being built and a handful of natural gas power plants being built, normally, they are just like-for-like like replacements. And in fact, with coal, um, given that the price of coal has recently gone up and Australia and the United States are, are putting, starting to put screws to the coal industry, uh, which is brand new in Australia, the United States has been going on for seven or eight years, maybe a decade. The financial system is no longer supporting fossil fuels as much as they had been. And that support just keeps getting eroded. You're going to hear an announcement from JP Morgan Chase. This is, I know a year ago, year and a half ago, when I told you the Ford was going to make a big announcement about EVs and hybrids, that they were going to go that direction full speed by the middle of this decade and get rid of almost all their gasoline powered cars by 2030. Probably just be some special editions by then. People didn't, didn't want to believe that. Well, I'm taking this information right out of what the executives are telling us. So don't let some narrative by a trader 
or some college kid writing for beer money, or some guy with no real experience managing money telling you how things are going to work in the future. Go back to the Jimmy Rogers things where he tells you, look, if you want to know what's going on, just read all the materials telling you that most of the analysis you read is not terribly well informed. They're not spending thousands of dollars on AIs. And I can tell you this because I'm in the financial letter industry. I know that 98% of the people out there that I'm competing with don't do this. They don't use Bloomberg. They don't use Sentio. They don't use anything similar, which simply means they cannot get the information because it's not out there in the press and, and gathering it from all of these sources. Look at this, 46,000 presentations. They're giving you lines of shit. And anybody who's telling you that alternative energy is not the future, and they have these stupid talking points, well, electricity has to come from somewhere. That's going to come from natural gas and coal. Again, farmer's words, bullshit. It's not what's happening now. That's not where the capital is going. That's not what the executives are telling us. That's not what the science is telling us. And that's not what the government is telling us. This is a chart of the natural gas industry projected profits and losses. Remember, I've told you, we only have the one natural gas investment, which is Kinder Morgan. And why is that? It's because the natural gas companies will be able to pay their bills for an extended period of time, but they're never going to grow again. And they have mountains and mountains of debt that are going to be very, very difficult long-term to pay off. And those shareholders are probably going to get diluted over in the natural gas stocks. This rebound in oil and gas stocks is probably your last opportunity to get yourself out of all of those stocks. You should divest every single oil and gas stock that you own because they have no future. Coal has no future. Oil has no future. Natural gas long-term has no future. It'll hold out for a decade or so. Sometime in the 2030s, the natural gas companies are going to be losing money. Again, why Kinder Morgan? Because until the 2030s, they'll still have a carry trade essentially on natural gas, getting their bills paid, paying out that fat dividend, and they're getting into carbon transport. They're the biggest out there right now, but it's still infantile. And then hydrogen is embryonic. But what we learned at CES last year, which is finally getting into the press this year, is that heavy transportation is probably going to use hydrogen. Your car never will. I mean, they'll have some spec cars out there for people who want to go to the four fill-up stations in town or have access to a truck depot. I mean, I guess a couple people might have hydrogen cars. Hydrogen is uniquely positioned for large transportation. Think ships, maybe airplanes, big trucks. But even there, they're going to get competition from EVs It really depends on what they're hauling. So your giant vehicle that has to move a mountain, probably not EV, but just hauling some freight, maybe. Hauling a unit off of a ship, one of those big metal boxes, intermodal, those probably be hydrogen because those are heavy. So Kinder Morgan, you want, because of the dividend, if there is a rally in oil and gas, it hangs in there, it benefits, but it's the backdoor play because of the right-of-ways on carbon and hydrogen. Now, that's not really the topic today. I just wanted to show you this curve. There's not a long-term future, even in natural gas, and that's the best fossil fuel. So if you go to the Rethink website and you get their report, what you end up finding, one of the more bullish projections on alternative energy, and they've undershot the mark. So this is the most bullish one, and they keep undershooting the mark. What they know and what we know is that solar, wind, and batteries 
are on the verge of being the cheapest out there already. And for sure by 2030, they'll be cheaper than all the fossil fuels, which is why this is going to happen. The IEA and the EIA is about to say the same thing, are already saying that it is cheaper to build a solar power plant with batteries than it is to build a coal power plant and operate it. The utilities are backing that up because that's exactly what they're doing. I told you about a year ago, maybe, that in Indiana, which is very coal heavy, they were tearing down an existing coal power plant that was operating about break even, tearing it down and replacing it with solar and batteries. I'm not sure how many people need to be convinced that this is what's happening. I think in my crowd, most of the people understand it, but there will be people on YouTube who don't want to believe it. There are people who are invested in Exxon and Chevron who don't want to believe it. There's a huge proxy war going on with Exxon over the future of that company. And management keeps pushing towards oil and gas. You've got investors telling them, what the hell are you doing? I'm telling you right now, the alternative energy investors in Exxon are going to win that battle. And part of the deal is going to be that they're going to have to slash their dividend and slash development of oil resources way further than they already have. That's going to mean massive write downs. Exxon is a stock that if you own it and you're not selling it, you don't really know what's going on at Exxon. In any case, this rethink report is something that you should read because it'll show you what's happening in alternative energy versus fossil fuels. There is a virtuous cycle going on in the alternative energy. Lower costs are important, but remember government support, that's part of our analysis. Our four-step analysis, big secular trends, what is government and central bank policy, and then what are the fundamentals? Well, the secular trend is towards alternative energy, government support is there, and the fundamentals are improving. On the opposite side, the big secular trend is away from fossil fuels. The government is not supporting it any anymore. And if you were reading the news this week, Biden basically said he's going to slash all the subsidies, direct and indirect, to the fossil fuel industry, wipe them out, which is what Elon Musk asked for five, six, seven years ago. He said, look, if we don't need any subsidies, just don't give anybody subsidies, and we'll crush fossil fuels. And he's right. Absence of tax breaks and other loopholes and forced to clean up their messes, fossil fuels are already way more expensive than alternative energy. But they get away with offloading expenses onto the public. It's called an externality cost, and it's a negative one in this case. There's externalities that are positive. There's also externalities that are negative. The externality is when you create an effect in the general public. Negative would be pollution. Positive would be cleaning up pollution. Pretty easy to understand. Well, the fossil fuel industry has been creating pollution and climate damage for decades. And I'm not gonna argue that we should have gotten rid of them sooner because for a very, very long time until this century, we needed them. So I don't know how much of a moral argument it is. At this point, it's becoming a moral argument because we now have the technology to replace fossil fuels and to cut our carbon footprint somewhere between 70 and 80 percent by 2050. I, I don't really believe that we'll get the carbon neutral, but we can get pretty close. And then if the technology for capturing carbon gets industrialized, well then, then maybe we can get the carbon neutral. I've told you about the one company in California that takes carbon and methane out of the air and turns it into plastic. If that gets widespread adoption, then carbon neutral is reality. So that's 20 to 30% of the climate change mix. So in any case, the fossil fuels are just getting crushed. So my warning to you today is if you haven't sold all of your fossil fuel stocks into this rally, with the exception of Kinder Morgan, for all the reasons we've gone through, you need to do it now. Because Saudi Arabia and the rest of the countries in the Middle East are not going to hold back much longer. And the U.S. producers are not going to get to drill 
on public land in the next four years. They're going to go to court. It's not going to matter because those lawsuits can get dragged out for years and years and years. There is another destruction of fossil fuel stocks imminent. And you need to wrap your head around it. You can fight me on it because I've been a little bit off on a couple of these trades in the past. Remember, I've made millions of dollars for myself and other people investing in oil stocks since 1999. And while I haven't traded the transition as well as I would have liked to, that doesn't change the nature of things. This chart from the IEA is pretty self-evident, I think. Renewable electricity additions stalled a little bit under Trump, COVID. Now it looks like it's ready to resume the trend. I'm not the only one who thinks so. Corporate projections and the government projections changed in one day, basically. When Trump lost, it's all changed. And I think this is on the light side. I think we're going to have double the solar generation that they're talking about in this chart, maybe triple or quadruple. So when you go to the IEA, which is notoriously in the moment versus forward looking, just take a look at the data trends. And they're pretty, pretty obvious. Coal is falling off already. Blue is basically now. Green is what's coming. Solar is the big winner. Why? Because the sun is everywhere. We use most of our energy during the daytime. You can put solar on anything. You don't have to turn a field into a solar farm, which is what the utilities are doing. And it's not really necessary, which is why I'm not hugely bullish on the transition in the utility industry, because I know that just by pitching your house in the right direction, putting solar up there, even without a battery, take care of 70 some odd percent of your power needs. Add a battery, you're at 90 some odd percent. Add two batteries, you're off the grid. We know that the battery technology is on the verge of being that cheap and at different sizes. That's another thing that you can look up right here. Be a zillion, zillion hits. Look at the companies that have projects. And what we find is that the utility scale batteries may not even be lithium because they don't have space constraints like you do at your house or in your car, especially. In the car, we're probably still going to be some sort of lithium. Quantum scape, which is the one under a short attack right now, it's trying to create a solid state lithium battery, which has been the holy grail for decades. And they're on the verge of doing it. They have a one safety hurdle to get through. Now, we don't know if they can get through that safety hurdle. That's the problem with quantum scape. But what I will tell you is I would reiterate what I keep saying. That eventually, if it's possible, the scientists figure it out. So in the handful of cases where a lithium battery has caught fire, it's usually a series of things that causes it. Creating a solid state battery basically doubles the efficiency of the battery. And if they can get over the hurdle, the thing's catching fire once in a while from multiple charges and then a jolt of her impact, so her malfunction, too much heat. If they can get over that, I think they'll be able to, through materials, which is what they seem to be focused on. Now, all of a sudden, who doesn't drive an EV? Even without solid state, EV batteries are almost there. One or two more generations just tweaking. But they actually have a breakthrough, takes them on a jump to the next level rather than inching their way there. Now you accelerate the timeline for EV adoption from the end of this decade to you know, even faster. Because EVs will probably be outselling gasoline cars late this decade. But what if gasoline cars are almost not being sold at all by 2030 because we have better batteries by 2025 and 2026? Those aren't far-fetched ideas. We're basically on that pace. It's going to take one more announcement, some significant breakthrough that's going to crush the gasoline industry by extension oil. When we're on Saturday Night Live, hear me now, believe me later, I'm going to pump you up. That's what's going on. 
So as we go through all the different charts that are out there, why does CapEx come down? Because we're going to do so much of it here. And what's interesting is this all it takes. This is all it's going to take to convert the grid. It's not going to take trillions of dollars. Don't fall for the scare tactics. Oh, the Green New Deal is going to bankrupt us. Again, farmer's words. Bullshit. We print this much money in our sleep. It's not even that expensive to do what we need to do. The output is so much more from doing this, there's a lot of money to be made from a little bit of going in. It's very scalable. Wind and solar power, right? This was the base case. This is the new accelerated case. And I think that's low. Again, I think that most of these projections are about half what they should be. And I think that this is an important chart to look at from Wood McKenzie. As the price of the systems have come down, Installed capacity has gone up. That's pretty basic economics, right? Lower price, higher demand. But how much has the price been coming down? Price of solar has already come down 20% in the last three years. And that was after a 90% drop over the last two decades. So the price of solar compared to 20 years ago, it's like 92, 93% lower. That's how fast it moved. So when some old timer says, well, I remember back in the 80s, we were supposed to go to solar. So I'm never investing in it again. Whatever. If you're inheriting from that person, you should encourage them to invest in solar and alternative energy. Or if you just don't want to pay their bills when they live to be 100, you should encourage them to invest in alternative energy and sell Exxon. Well, the Exxon's got my dividend. Exxon is the same price today as it was 20 years ago and only because of the recent rally. It's going to lose 50% again. So what do we want to invest in? I've updated the ETF trends, ETF favorites list. I want to go through some of the funds that we look at. This one here, the Global X Renewable Energy, this is the one that used to be Yield Co. But because a lot of the Yield Co's are getting absorbed and bought out, and Brookfield bought a couple, there's not really a lot of direct dividend plays in alternative energy yet. There will be, because once they get past the CapEx cycle, I just showed you, once we get past the heavy CapEx cycle, see that their expenses come down, but the revenues will stay high. So at some point, there will be pretty heavy dividends from these projects. I think it's about a decade off. That's something to keep in mind. These will be tomorrow's dividend payers. So if you're in your 30s or 40s or 50s, you ride the growth and then collect the dividends to get older. These will transition pretty naturally if you're middle age, you know, 10, 20, 30 years away from retirement. PBW is my favorite. It's a liquid fund with $2 billion in it. iClean is another favorite, $5 billion fund. And then these are some of the smaller ones. This closed-end fund used to be MLPs mainly and has transitioned to a, a broader mix. I think it can attract assets. Then the Invesco Solar ETF, if you're a trader, go ahead and use this. But I'd be careful with it because it's very volatile. It makes for good trading. And it has been a top performer. I will show you why I like PBW instead. Not much in the way of dividends, half a percent, pretty much across the board. Um, RNRG is about 1%. But then this one, again, if you're a retiree, this is pretty interesting. They just changed their portfolio over from fossil fuels and going towards alternative energy and other types of infrastructure. So this is something that I'll show you since they changed their portfolio. It's actually been a little bit better than the S&P 500 paying the dividend. Not a direct alternative energy play, but for those of you who want something a little bit more diversified. Take a look at the prices. Over the last three years, these alternative energies have done very well, right? And again, this wasn't including an alternative energy back then. This fund changed your portfolio in March, about a year ago. Big secular trends. In the short term, the last three months, they've had a bit of a correction. We'll take a look at these corrections here in a second. All right, so here is EBW sold off. And then the retail investors bid it up because of the cheap money from the Fed. It got to the point of being wildly exuberant, which 
fell off. On a daily chart, it peaked a little higher. That's, that's where I draw these lines using the daily chart. 0.5 fib down to the 0.618 fib, your standard expectation for a correction. It's almost there. I actually have nibbled it a little bit right here at about 88. It's not necessary, but I had cash that I wanted to deploy. Down here around 80, it gets, starts to get pretty juicy. If it gets down towards 70, super juicy because you run into a confluence of support levels. Now, could it get all the way back down here? I guess. Somehow Trump was named the winner of the election. I, I, don't, I don't think unless we have a major liquidity event, you see it below about 65, 66. But I think pretty heavy buying comes in on the institutional side. You take a look at their components. It is pretty heavily solar, but not exclusive. And with 69 holdings, fairly equal weight, pretty diversified fund. Got some basic materials, some utilities, cyclicals, industrials. So I'd encourage you to look at the whole list here. Companies, pretty diversified. Compared to TAN, all these charts are gonna look about the same, which is all solar and very top heavy. If you want super top heavy, understand what these top 10 holdings are, then you can trade this fund. And I plan to do it. Take a look at iClean. All these charts look about the same, don't they? Global clean energy. And I'm gonna take this one off the list because A, it's small and it's similar to iClean and more expensive. So why use it? So what I'm leaving on our list is PVW, iClean, TAN, and then for your income generated, wanting more diversification, SCC. Yeah, where's my chart? And then here's our comparison chart. We can look at different time frames. So this goes back to sell off at the end of 2018. This is that Cushing fund. Notice this is when it was loaded up on fossil fuel stocks, got crushed from the pandemic. Then they changed their portfolio. Now I'll, I'll zoom this in, more recent. But here is TAN, here's PBW iClean, PBD. So why do we need PBD? iClean is cheaper and more diversified. And if you want to trade something, go real concentrated with TAN, right? There's SPY and QQQ down here. SPY, QQQ, RNRG, right? It tracks the S&P 500. You don't really need it. Now let's go back to a year ago to the crash and this coincides with SZC changing their portfolio. So there you go. In the last year, this fund, since it changed its portfolio, has actually beaten the S&P 500. And I don't know that it's going to beat the S&P 500 by much, but I do think it'll be a little bit better, and it pays that big fat dividend. So for those of you who want something more diversified, it takes into account alternative energy without being 100% in alternative energy. SZC, which I pointed out several months ago, I think late last year, was a play for, you, for the retirees. So pretty evident that we want to use these two for sure. Bump that one. Bump that one. A lot of people have asked me why I don't like iClean. I do like iClean. I'm the one that brought it up. But I like PBW better. In my mind, I think evidence has shown this over and over again, a fund with under 100 stocks will tend to do better than a fund with over 100 stocks. And when you take a look at how these two are distributed versus iClean, it's just a matter of what you want to own more. And do you want something that's this top heavy? iClean has been adopted by a lot of the millennial traders. And I think that being so top heavy, right? Top 10 is half the portfolio. It's going to move a lot more. So from a safety standpoint, I like PBW, more equal weighted. You can definitely trade iClean, just like you can trade TAN. But if you're going to trade, you might as well trade TAN because it sells better. All right. Any questions about what's coming in alternative energy, how to invest here? I'm going to write a how to invest in alternative energy article that takes into account these things. I'll include a ton of charts. I uh, have gotten 
handful of people who unsubscribe saying, look, I like his videos, but I prefer to have everything in writing. Okay, so I'll put everything in writing. So you can see we're getting close to where you should be thinking about PBW. If I nibble in around 80, start backing up the truck if it gets under 70. Again, unless there's some weird event going on. Look at all the confluence. Look at all the different lines that are bunched up. That usually indicates pretty strong support. SCZ, we were just in the buy zone. I was talking about this all down in here. So I think you let it pull back under 37. Somebody mentioned uh, Lockheed Martin for utility scale batteries. Yeah, so the whole deal with utility scale batteries is that they don't have to be lithium, right? Because there's not a space constraint. One of the reasons we use lithium is because you can make small batteries. Well, these power walls from Tesla, the nice thing about them is they're, they're small and they work, but they're really expensive. Let me ask you, if somebody said, look, you can buy the power wall for whatever it's costing, 10, 12, 15, 20,000, whatever it is you're gonna need for how many of them you need, or I can sell you something as big as a freezer. You know, how many of you have an extra freezer in your house? If I can sell you something as big as a freezer for 80% less money, and it does the same thing, you'd rather have that. I think that most people are gonna say, yeah, my house is big enough, I, or I got a garage, or we put it outside underneath some sort of you know, structure, I'll do the one that's 80% less money. And that's, that, and that's, that's what, what the difference is. The difference is cost for size. And in places where you're not size constrained on the battery, you can get a very cheap battery. The flow batteries are very good already. The power cells are pretty good too. So you don't need lithium unless you're space constrained. So really the biggest jump we have to make, and it's only one more level. I mean, we're literally one level away on the car batteries. So whether we inch our way there over a decade or we have a big jump off the next few years, I don't know. Quantum scape is a bet on the big jump up. Everybody else is kind of a bet on incremental improvement. Quantum scape is the closest when it comes to solid state lithium batteries for cars. There's nobody really even close. And they have huge funding. I mean, you're talking Bill Gates, Tesla, Rantham. And there's a lot of big, big investors in QuantumScape. So this little short attack article says, oh, they're a fraud. Again, farmers where it's bullshit. They're not a fraud. Everybody knows what the challenge is. The challenge is, is can you keep the battery from exploding? And if they can, which they probably will be able to, at some point, they're a big deal. So if you want a real long-term investment, I would say you could probably start nibbling in on QuantumScape because it's gotten hammered. And I don't know where the ultimate huge support is, clearly in the 20s, right? See this line here? I mean, it's almost to the huge support area. And for those of you who will tune in on Tuesday or watch the retirement show, I mean, it's not really a retirement stock from the standpoint of the way you normally think of a retirement stock. But if you are going to be retired for the next 30 years, you want to take like 1% of your money and toss it at this, sell some cash secured puts on it because the premiums are huge. Go ahead and do that. Sell the $25 put. That's right. Retired guys still need capital gains. And why is that? Look, I've got two grandmothers that are 92 years old, one that just beat COVID. If people born in the 1920s are still alive, how long are we going to live that we were born in the 50s, 60s, or 70s, or 80s? We're all living to be 100 unless we do something to ourselves or get unlucky. So you can't look at retirement investing in the standpoint of everything's got to be stable. No. The nature of what I do is I try to buy things close to their bottoms to eliminate a lot of the volatility, right? When this went like this, and all those charts that we've seen... I've showed over and over again in all the different webinars, this chart screams, I'm going to get volatile, right? Any chart that ever does that, unless it really truly is the next big thing, is in trouble. Let, let's compare this to another chart, right? Pipe takes more time for the project or technology to work. Investors sell off to get disillusioned. Everybody hates it. And then it starts coming back and it becomes the you know pretty good investment. Well, take a look at the quantum scape chart. 
Those shapes look similar to you? I think they do. Type, profit disillusionment, got a short attack here. Some point it'll bottom, then it'll start going back up. And if they're successful, it's going to go way higher than 130. We just aren't positive that they're going to be successful. Can they make these types of batteries 100% safe? I think they can, but we don't know that. But if they can, this is breakthrough technology. And I have a hard time betting against the scientists, especially ones that are this far along and this well-funded. Their batteries are already cheap enough. I mean, the material they're putting in there, I mean, if you understand cathodes and anodes and things like that, they just have to make sure that the dendrites don't touch. And they've found a material that looks like it'll do it. That's what sparks the fires. We'll see. I suspect it's going to work. I don't know how fast they can make this commercial and industrial. But I think that if you want to put a percent or two on what could be one of the biggest things ever, seriously, I mean, this technology could go into most cars. Volkswagen's got to deal with them already. Chop, 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 bam. It's worth having a couple bucks in. I don't know exactly how you scale in just yet. I suspect I'm going to start selling puts because the volatility is super high. And the premiums are really good. And the support is down here in the 20 somewhere. Somebody says, is that a risk worth taking at 20? I don't know. It might be a risk worth taking right now. If you're truly a long-term investor. Buy a little now. Buy a little at 30. Buy a little at 25. Buy a shit ton at 20. And I think it might be worth taking the risk right now. That's why we scale in. If you try to be too perfect, you miss a lot of opportunities. All right, let's call it a day, and I will get this posted, and I will get this report. That's what I'm working on this weekend. We've got a lot to work on this weekend, but I'm working on this in particular because I think it's important, and I think that we're getting pretty darn close to wanting to expand our holdings in alternative energy. Um, one thing to keep in mind is when they get this new bill passed, the infrastructure and stealth Green New Deal, as Wall Street Journal called it, these stocks are going to bounce again. So selling puts and scaling in. You know, that's why I took the one, you know, I took the small position already at 88. I think this is really where it's going to get. But the market has fooled me before. That's why you, you know, in, in the search of perfection, you can find excellence. And part of being excellent is scaling in. Because if you miss the low price by a buck because you wanted that one extra dollar and you miss completely, you have, you don't know you don't own any. That's why you scale in a little at a time, half percents, one percents, until you get to the position that you want. Now, I think the PBW is going to be a 12% position for me, an eighth of my money. It might even be a sixth of my money. It might be 16%. I don't think it'll be a quarter of my money, but we'll see. And I would have loved for it to be a quarter of my money a year ago. All right. We'll talk about the SPACs on Monday. Take care.